Hi, I'm Anna. Welcome back to Books on the Go. I'm here with a wrap-up video today. So it's the books I've been reading in October. It's not quite the end of the month, but I've got quite a few to get through. So I thought I might as well give you a quick update now. And one that I might have even read in September, but I don't think I have talked about it yet on the channel, but I could be wrong, is Empire of Pain by Patrick Radden Keefe. Have I spoken about this? I can't remember now, but it's really, really good. So I'm recommending this one. It's non-fiction. It's about the Sackler family in America. Um, they have a company called Purdue, which is a pharmaceutical company. They made their money on Valium, um, which is not widely known, well it is now, but um, it wasn't they, it was something they publicised and then they were the company through the family that um, introduced OxyContin to the market and also introduced the idea of aggressively marketing drugs and going to doctors and telling doctors this is what you need to be prescribing. So something that went from being a morphine which was very much an end of life drug it was something you'd only ever see in hospitals in you know in the in extreme circumstances they started marketing to gps saying it's not addictive which it, it is they marketed it saying it's not addictive and it's safe and this is your pain relief first choice and lasting choice pain relief the first one to turn to and we all know how that's ended, which is not ended, but we all know the consequences of that, which has been the opioid crisis in America. Um, but this is so well written. I loved that it combined the family history, the history of the pharmaceutical industry, the marketing and advertising industry around that in America, and also the legal implications because there's there are legal cases on foot which are still in the news today. Um, the way the institutions failed, like the FDA among others, and also the art sector. So they have been very active in philanthropy, giving large sums of money to institutions like the Met, um, and others, even uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London springs to mind, and there are others that are outlined here, but they've wanted to be recognised for that. And so the Sacklers have become synonymous with arts philanthropy, and yet no one realised where the money came from and didn't con they didn't connect them with Purdue, the company, because they'd been carefully kept their names separate. So really fascinating read. It is chunky, but don't let that put you off because it's a fast paced read and I really enjoyed this. So that's Empire of Pain. So next up, a book that I've been so excited for. This is Harlem Shuffle by Colson Whitehead and it came out in the last month or so. I loved Colson Whitehead's Nickel Boys and I uh, also thought the, the Underground Railroad was excellent, but the Nickel Boys I just thought was a masterpiece and I think he can do no wrong. So then when I heard he was doing a crime novel, that was, you know, just too exciting. And it's Harlem Noir. So it's set in the 1960s in Harlem about a the main character is a fencer. So he has a legitimate business and then he's got stolen goods out the back. And his name is Ray Carney, I think. Um, yes, he's an upstanding salesman of furniture, but then he has the the crime aspect as well. So the thing was, though, I haven't been able to keep reading it because I got a bit bored. So um, I feel terrible saying that I can't believe that, it, you know, nothing, Colson Whitehead can't write a boring sentence and each sentence is wonderful and the the descriptions are spot on as always. He's got the sense of humour underlying it and he's just such a, a virtuosic writer. But as a crime novel, this isn't working for me because the story isn't, it's taking a while to really get going. He's carefully describing each character, where they've come from, the setting, the shop, the details, the pe you know, the period details, and it's all there, but the, the story hasn't 
got going yet and so I've sort of stopped reading it at uh, 68 pages um, let me know if you've been reading this I did speak to Annie because I thought we might have said we'd do it on the podcast and I said I haven't been able to get on with it and she said she couldn't either so let me know if you've been reading it I'd love to hear your thoughts but at the moment this one is a DNF which is shocking to me but there you go you can't um, keep plowing through if it's not you know the right book for you so that's Harlem Shuffle then I went away recently we went up to far north Queensland for a, just a five-day holiday which was a real treat in these times as you can imagine and much of Australia can't travel or they're starting to now but um, it was a time of feeling very very lucky to go anywhere at all and of course beautiful weather and a bit of time for reading so I read Four Hairs and Me An Encounter by Jay Perini and this is an interesting book I don't know a lot about Jorge Borges I've read one or two of his stories and I'm fascinated by his mind and his reputation and his writing and idiosyncrasies and of course he's a giant of literature and Jay Perini is a non-fiction writer I believe although I could be wrong he's a professor of English and he has published eight novels I'm completely wrong there you go but also written biographies of John Steinbeck, Robert Frost, William Faulkner and Gore Vidal and he's edited the Oxford Encyclopedia of American Literature. So he's a heavyweight himself. And this is the story of him in the 1970s when he was in Scotland, or was he in St Andrews, Scotland, I think, and just for a year. And one of his friends, uh, one of his mentors, was hosting Jorge Borges for some time in his house. But Jay Perini was asked to drive Borges around up to Inverness in northern Scotland. So spend a week on the road with him, which, as you can imagine, is great uh, fodder for a, a story. And indeed, he says in the afterward, he's been dining out on these stories for years. And so someone did finally say, look, this would be a great movie. You should write the book. And that's the, what this has stemmed from. So this is the story of his week with Borges, where he's driving him around reluctantly at the time, because uh, Jay Perini was a student. He hadn't heard of Borges, as shocking as that sounds to us now. And it was an imposition on him. And plus, Borges was quite a, an eccentric character and, you know, not necessarily easy to corral into the car. And he was quite blind, I think. So it was a very, you know, it had the, has the makings of an odd couple sort of story. So you can see why people have urged him to... Uh, get this down and it's quite entertaining but what he's done is he's semi-fictionalized it and I think that's out of necessity because he can't remember exactly what the conversations were and he's put himself into it quite a lot and particularly this infatuation with a young woman called Bella who is at university I think with him and his sort of constantly trying to phone her or get in touch with her while they're on the road and worrying that she doesn't care about him which is you know which it seemed to me she didn't care much about him but anyway Belle is a real focus of Jay's story Jay Perini's story and he doesn't have much respect for Borges because he hasn't heard he hasn't heard of him and he's Argentinian and he just that Jay Perini of that time doesn't think that he's anyone special and so there are some wonderful little set pieces or vignettes of Borges you know reciting poetry in a boat or doing something eccentric and giving some advice here and there and I really enjoyed those bits but because of who Borges is and that's who I'm fascinated by I just wanted more of that I didn't need the Jay Perini side of things and I think it's in there to try to make it relatable or to to make it it's like a personal memoir sort of style but I I just found it was very American centric and that's maybe of its time because now he might have a different view of this great Argentinian writer and so he's placing himself back in his as a student in the 70s so it's understandable but it just didn't quite 
strike the tone that I wanted, which is probably unfair because um, it's not a Borges memoir. It's, you know, Jay Perini. So, yeah, I wanted more Borges and less of Jay. That was the the crush on Bella, didn't interest me and, and so on. So that's where I got to, but, uh, you know, an enjoyable read. So I'd be interested to know your thoughts. So that is Borges and me. Um, then I read this little gem, Assembly by Natasha Brown, and this, of course, has been doing the rounds. I've seen it everywhere on social media, and I had to pick it up. When I saw how small it was, I didn't hesitate because I realised there's nothing to nothing to lose. It's a very quick read, but it, actually it was a book that I wanted to stop on every page and really take in what was being said. So this, this is about a young woman or she might be in her 20s I think 20s maybe early 30s Um, she's a banker in London she's a young black woman and about to get a promotion or hoping to get a promotion and really at the pinnacle of her career and has worked extremely hard to get there and she has a white boyfriend who's an up-and-coming politician and from a conservative sort of family but they like to think they're very liberal and So it's really about her experience of racism, the weight of history that she lives with, the everyday racism, the battles that she has to face all the time that are not necessarily seen or acknowledged or understood by a lot of white people. And even her boyfriend who, you know, would think of himself as very modern or as very woke, for example, has no concept of what she goes through and he himself lives life very freely and just does whatever he wants whereas she feels much more constrained to do what's expected of her and to do what's seen as respectable for a black woman and she has lots of hoops she has to jump through just to get you know to make career decisions whereas he just goes on a whim um, half the time and it's really interesting. It, all of this is sort of explored in a very, very small book and in very few words, but it's enough to give you exactly a sense of the character, the story, the, the scene in the office where she, the promotion is discussed is probably only a page or two, but really succinctly evokes that sort of scene. You can picture it really clearly. So I loved this. I thought it was excellent and recommending it. That's Assembly by Natasha Brown. Then another really um, hotly anticipated book, Matrix by Lauren Groff. So this is her follow-up to the novel Fates and Furies, which was Obama's best book of 2015 and I think she had a short story collection after that possibly called Florida but this is Matrix it's about a poet called Marie so she's sent by Queen Eleanor to an abbey in England to run an abbey and it's very poor they've got no not much food and the nuns there are struggling and she tries to bring it to a you know, to improve the the situation there. And she's quite a tall, strong woman, and she's also writing poetry. So it's it, it was inspired by a lecture that Lauren Groff went to on Benedictine nuns in the 12th century. So this is all set in medieval times. A lot of people are raving about this book. So uh, Daisy Johnson called it Luminous Divine her masterpiece and Daisy Johnson someone who I always trust her reviews so I went into this with very high expectations although I have to say that premise you know the plot didn't the blurb didn't sell it to me although nuns and monasteries and abbeys I think can be fascinating places to set a novel but because it's Lauren Groff and I enjoyed Fates and Furies and Daisy Johnson called it a masterpiece I went in high expectations and could not get on with this. I'm sorry to say, I just couldn't engage. The writing, again, really strong. She has such a muscular writing style, really poetic, um, but it just seemed quite sort of mythical and fairy tale esque. And Marie, I didn't connect with her. It was a bit vague as to where she was. It took me ages to work out that she'd been that she was in England because. I didn't, yeah, she didn't seem English um, and I think she was sent from France, but that none of that was sort of clear. And then the Abbey, there was no tension. There just wasn't any, you know, 
I was never concerned for her, even though they were quite poor and struggling. It didn't seem to matter. Um, I just couldn't get on with it. So I'm sorry to say I had to bail on this one. I sort of skimmed through to the end because we did it on the podcast. So to hear more of our thoughts and to hear what Annie thought about it, that is coming up next week. I've, we've recorded that discussion now and that will be up next week on Books on the Go podcast. But I was disappointed because I thought I was going to love it as a feminist story of nuns but um, there you go so that was Matrix and then just as a sort of palate cleanser I and because I just felt like an easy read I read The Man Who Died Twice by Richard Osman I really enjoyed the Thursday Murder Club loved this you know very happy to sink into that world of the luxury retirement village with the diverse characters and sort of Mrs. Marple style sleuthing. This one also has MI5 and it's quite cosy in the sense you never feel really worried for them, but it's so enjoyable. It's got a, he's got a great sense of humour. It's very English, but modern, you know, brings it into the modern, modern day Britain, which I really liked. So if you want a good crime novel that won't be too challenging, I can recommend The Man Who Died Twice. So that's it. I'm currently reading the new Elif Shafak novel, which I can never remember the name of, but I think it's The Island of Missing Trees. So I'll report back on that soon. Let me know what you've been reading and I will see you soon. Bye for now.